In the last video, we introduced the idea of gravity along with our circular motion by looking at a vertical circle being swung, uh, so like a ball on a string. Now we're going to look at how can you make a vertical circle using surfaces. Um, and you've experienced this before if you've ever been on a roller coaster or driven on a road that has a hill or um, a valley where you feel a little weightless or you feel pressed into your seat, you are experiencing vertical circular motion with the surface. So let's talk about the forces that are at play and how we can relate them to our understanding of circular motion thus far. So we're going to start out uh, just by reviewing these different variables and the equations that are in your data booklet. Again, you should be familiar with all six of these, as well as the different um, rearrangings of the equations so that you can use the one that, that makes sense for the values that you are given. Now, before we can talk about circular motion because of surfaces, we need to talk about the force that surfaces apply again. Uh, and we called that force the normal reaction force. In IB, we represent that using the, the capital letter R for the normal reaction force. And remember the key concept here is that this R value can only point perpendicular to the surface. A surface is only going to apply a force perpendicular to it. So um, we can show that here kind of in this little exorcist moment. Um, that the R is always going to point in the direction of the surface, but FG, like force of gravity, is always going to point down. That doesn't change relative to the surface orientation, but R does. Um, I will point out that in that animation, one thing that's not true is this case. in this case is that these vectors probably wouldn't stay the same length. The magnitude would probably change. Here in this model, I'm just showing that the direction changes according to the slope, um, not getting into the magnitude changing there. But like I mentioned, we can talk about this in terms of a roller coaster. Now you might look at this picture and say, there is no circle there, there's no circular motion. But the reality is most dips can be approximated like a circle. So they, they still kind of take on a radius and you can figure out what the circle of that radius would be. Uh, in this case, let's say that that has a radius of eight. Um, so if you were to extend that portion of the track you could see how it forms part of a circle. And when it is in that bottommost part, it is in circular motion, even though it's not going to complete a full circle. It's still accelerating towards the center of that imaginary circle that exists. Now, if I want to draw a free body diagram for this, I know that I'm going to have an overall force that is equal to the centripetal force. Centripetal force always points towards the center of the circle. So here, if I'm at the bottom of this valley, I'm at the bottom of the circle and centripetal force has to be pushing me upward towards the center of the circle. If I were a little bit farther along, it would push me slightly diagonal to wherever the center of the circle happens to be. But as we did with the, the tension circles, um, we are gonna be looking primarily at just the bottom and the top of these points in the, the figure. So here I know that overall the forces have to equal the centripetal force or the net force, they're one and the same, um, which means that this isn't one particular force acting on the object, it's the sum of all the forces. But we have enough information to actually calculate what that should be, because centripetal force is just mass times velocity squared over r. This equation is going to be your best friend in this unit, and we can calculate that because we know m, v, and r, 200 times 10 squared divided by 8 gives me a centripetal force of 2,500 newtons. 2,500 newtons is a centripetal force. Like I mentioned, centripetal force and net force are one and the same. So that's also uh, 2,500 newtons. Whichever one is more comfortable for you, that's fine. Um, I'm showing both of them here. This is not a force acting on the object. It is an overall sum of the forces acting on the object. The main two forces that are at play here are the force of gravity, Fg, pulling down, and the normal reaction force. The track is pushing up on this roller coaster car. And the track can only push perpendicular to itself, pushing on the object. So it is pushing upward because that's perpendicular to the surface. It's pushing up. Um, so R is going up, Fg is going down. Just looking at my diagram right here, I know, uh, sorry, the diagram right here, I know that R has to be bigger than Fg because 
the overall force must be upward um, because that's where the center of the circle is. So I know right off the bat how these are going to compare to each other. Um, we don't know how to find R yet, but we do know how to find FG. We always do because FG is mass times gravity. The mass is 200 kilograms. So 200 times 9.81 is 19.62. FG is 19.62. Now you just need to look at your free body diagram and figure out the missing force because you know everything except for R. You know that um, FC or the net force is 2,500 and FG is 1962. So R has to be bigger than that by the amount of the net force. Um, or another way to think of it is the net force is R minus the force of gravity. Gravity is counteracting that centripetal force, which means if I wanted to find R, I just add them together. It's basically what we did in the last video, just shown with math to find that it's 4,462 newtons pointing upward. Again, let's just do a sanity check to make sure R is larger than FG. If we were to subtract those two, uh, we end up with the net force or centripetal force that we calculated at the beginning. All right, now let's look to see what would happen if this roller coaster was moving at the top. At the top, we're usually moving a little slower, so I've decreased the velocity to five meters per second. But just as before, we can approximate a circle. Um, so in this case, it's at the top of that circle, and we'll still call it a radius of eight, keep that the same, which means that my centripetal force must be pointing downward because the center of the circle is downward now, because we're at the top. Um, we can calculate what that centripetal force has to be because I know M, V, and R. The mass is 200, the velocity is five, and radius is eight. So 200 times five squared over eight is 625 newtons. I can plug that in for my centripetal force. Centripetal and net force are the same thing. Now let's draw in what the forces look like. I know that the gravity is always pulling down. Gravity is downward here, FG is down. Um, but now uh, my track is here, my car is sitting on top of that. It is going to be pushing on the car perpendicular to the track, which means that R is pointing up. Um, now looking at this picture, I see that the overall force has to be down which means that FG has to be larger than R um, because that's the only way that these two forces are going to simplify to be a downward overall force. I can find FG. FG is mass times gravity. 200 times 9.8 is 1,962. Same as it was in the last problem. It has not lost mass. Um, so now if I want to find R, I just need to look at how do these interact to give me what R should be. Overall, I have a force of 625 going down. Gravity provides 1,962 of that, which means R has to counteract. Um, so one way I can write that is F net is FG minus R, um, or R would just be FG minus F net. Um, it's the difference between them, which would give me 1,337. My biggest recommendation here is don't try to think of this as an equation. Instead, think of it as a simple picture that you know that down has to be overall 625 and FG is already 1962. What does R have to be so that it cancels out FG just enough to give you 625? So don't think of it as a set equation. Think of it as a picture that you're just trying to solve for the missing force. All right, looking at these two with numbers, you should see that they, they add up appropriately. Um, so if you redraw it with numbers, it should totally make sense um, given the numbers that you calculate. So here the difference between these two is 625 going down. Here the difference between these two is 2,500 newtons going up. Something that I alluded to at the beginning here, if you've ridden a roller coaster, you've experienced this, that at the bottom, if you're going really fast, at the bottom of these, you get pushed into your seat and you start to feel heavier. And at the top, you kind of start feeling like you're floating up, you feel lighter. There's this feeling of weightlessness. You're not actually weightless, but your perceived weight is changing. Turns out that the way that we perceive our weight is just by the surface that's pushing up on us. Like if you're sitting on a chair, you perceive your weight because the chair is pushing up on you 
equal to your weight. But if we are changing how much the chair is pushing, your, per um, your perception of that weight is changing as well. So this normal reaction force is representing uh, the perceived weight. If R is larger than FG, so if how much the chair is pushing on you is greater than it typically would, because it's greater than your, your force of gravity, you're going to feel like you're squished into your seat. You're going to feel heavier. This is what we call pulling Gs, um, that the number, the magnitude difference. So here it looks like I'm more than double the force of gravity, which means I'm pulling like two Gs on this roller coaster. I'm experiencing more than twice the force of gravity in this case. If R is less than the force of gravity, you are perceived feeling a kind of a weightlessness because um, your chair is pushing on you less than it would if you were just sitting there because it's less than your weight. Now, the ultimate example of this is if you get R all the way to zero. This is the ultimate weightless experience. And if you've heard of, there's an airplane called the Vomit Comet that basically just flies these giant parabolic arcs. Uh, going at a 45 up and then leveling off and dipping down. And there is a period here that you feel weightless in this, that if you see video of people in the Vomit Comet, you'll see that they are floating up in the air. Let's check that out right now. So in the Vomit Comet, they actually start you out on the, on the ground. You're just laying there uh, because most of the flight, you do have a perceived weight. But once it gets to the top of this parabolic arc, you'll notice that people start floating and they kind of they're flying around here. So let's see some more, some more examples of this. It's pretty expensive to fly in the Vomit Comet. It's a dream of mine, but I've never had the opportunity to do it because I just don't have the money to make it happen. And one of the reasons that this is used is to train astronauts um, for that feeling of weightlessness. Uh, but you'll see all sorts of examples of people using it um, for different cool, cool effects. So to talk about the physics that's actually happening there, let's think about the forces that are at play at the top and the bottom of this parabolic arc. Um, we know that at the top, uh, it's approximated like a circle here. so. Overall, I should have a centripetal force pointing down and my force of gravity is pointing down. So if I have just the right centripetal force that it equals gravity, that means I don't need any force of R to add up with gravity to give me my centripetal force. Gravity is equal to the centripetal force, so there is no R. Uh, if there's no R, no normal reaction force, you don't perceive any weight because the surface is not pushing at you at all. At the bottom, however, centripetal force has to point up. Force of gravity is still pointing down, which means in order to get an overall upward force, this is where you pay for it. Uh, your force of normal reaction force has to be that much greater, almost double the force of gravity, which means in order for those moments of weightlessness at the bottom here, uh, you end up feeling twice as heavy. Uh, so you'll see people are lying down on the ground, getting pushed into the ground um, in those moments between those weightless flights. One final example that you should be familiar with just in case is the loop-de-loop. -loop. So in both of these first examples with the, um, the roller coaster, the track was underneath the roller coaster car. So we knew that R was pointing up, but R doesn't have to point up. It just has to push on the object perpendicular to itself. So if this object is on a loop-de-loop -loop going to the top, normally, so centripetal force would have to point down, but normally R would also point down uh, because it is pushing on the object in the direction of its motion or a direction of where the object is relative to the track. Now, for the velocity to make it all the way around a loop-de-loop, -loop, R has to be greater than zero because if R is less than zero somehow, um, then it's no longer pushing enough and it's going to lose contact with the track. So if we figure out what's going on here, FG uh, is going down and the extreme is, that would still mostly work is if R is exactly zero. 
anything beyond that extreme, we're, we're not going to be able to figure anything out uh, because the, the car is going to lose contact with the track. But if R is zero, that means that all of the centripetal force is coming from the force of gravity. And this is our boundary point. This is the limit to um, what would actually work in the loop to loop. So we can actually calculate that then because centripetal force would equal the force of gravity and centripetal force is just mass times velocity squared over R. Gravity is mass times gravity. Mass cancels out. And so you can solve for the velocity it has to be the square root of gravity times the radius, which is a weirdly simple equation. Uh, if you wanted to find the minimum velocity that would have to happen to be able to go through a loop to loop. Um, anything slower than this is not going to make it anything faster than this, you're going to have a normal reaction force pushing down. If you've ever experienced a loop to loop, um, on a roller coaster, you experience weight still, you're still being pushed into your seat. That's because thankfully you are going over the minimum velocity. So R is not zero R is something, it might be less than your typical weight. Um, but you are still experiencing some sort of push from the roller coaster seat on you. So some takeaways here, you should be able to compare the forces of an object at different positions in a vertical circular motion, uh, determine the magnitude and direction of the forces. But then here for surfaces, you should be able to qualitatively describe how the normal reaction force changes. Uh, so you should know at the top uh, of like a roller coaster track, you start to feel a little lighter because R is smaller. At the bottom, you feel heavier because R is pushing you uh, a little bit harder. And then you should be able to describe this idea of weightlessness in terms of normal reaction force. Probably a better term for weightlessness would be normal reaction forcelessness. That's maybe not a better term, but you're not actually weightless. Gravity is still pulling on you just as much. It's just the surface is no longer pushing on you as much depending on where you are in that vertical circular motion.